The wildlife filmmaking industry can be extremely hard to break into, as I think we're all very aware. But now imagine if you lived in a country that had little to no wildlife filmmaking industry at all. Wouldn't that be crazy? Well, that's exactly what this episode's guest had to deal with. My guest this episode is Shripad Sridhar from India. And Shripad knew from a very young age what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be a wildlife photographer and a wildlife filmmaker, and he spent lots of his spare time doing so. But his parents had very different plans for him. And so Shripad went through a very traditional uh, kind of educational upbringing until, however, a life-changing event that showed Shripad that he needed to follow his dreams. And that's what this episode is all about. But first, a word from our sponsor. This podcast is proudly powered by Battleborn Batteries. Let the power of lithium take you on your journeys across the outdoor world. Battleborn Batteries is the industry's top choice for lithium ion batteries. Reliable, safe, and long lasting, Battleborn makes the sustainable and lightweight drop in replacement for traditional lead acid batteries. Are you ready to make the switch to lithium and switch to green energy? If so, all batteries are in stock now, and you can shop today at battlebornbatteries.com. Shripad, thank you so much for taking the time out of your late evening, because I know there in India, it's like 10 o'clock at night, 9.30 in the morning where I am. Thank you for staying up and uh, joining me on the Master Wildlife Film uh, Making Podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Shripad, I, I was um, really fascinated when we connected over uh, over um, Instagram, uh, just looking at your beautiful films that you've you've been making over the years, and just your story um, in general. And we'll we'll get we'll get into the the kind of details as we go along. But first of all, the way I always start all of these is getting the listeners to know a little bit about Shripad and your your journey from when you were young and really what it was that inspired you to get into wildlife filmmaking. If we could start there, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I think uh, I, I grew up in a house with a dog and I also grew up in, a, uh, in the city in a house with a garden, which is quite, uh, I think, a privilege, I think. And uh, the garden was full of frogs and centipedes and, uh, uh, you know, garden lizards and so many uh, different animals that um, they were always a part of my life. And I could see, you know, uh, wild animals on TV because I was uh, a, a nature television addict. You know, I used to constantly watch uh, Nat Geo and Discovery at the time when I was growing up. So I was, I, I, I was, I was always exposed to, you know, different kinds of animals and their lives. And and since I had a dog, I very intimately got to know an animal. So you know, you live, live through its life, you know, the, from from a pup till the time it dies and passes away. So you form a relationship with them. And so I always had a feeling that that's how probably all animals are. You always have, you can actually bond with or have a connection with most animals, wild animals that you see. So, uh, so I always had that fascination going on. And uh, I think when I was in school, just getting out of school around uh, my 12th grade or so, uh, that's when my the photography bug got me. And I started, uh, that was a time uh, in India you had, uh, or around the world that you had these small uh, consumer grade uh, you know, uh, digital cameras coming out. Um, and they were like these three megapixel, five megapixel, tiny cameras. But the wonderful thing about those cameras is it had an excellent macro feature. So uh, even though, the, the, I mean, the rest of the camera, you know, it didn't have a great telephoto or anything like that, the macro features on these cameras were excellent. And, and, and most of these cameras, the Sony or the uh, Canon cameras, came with Zeiss lenses on, you know, those tiny, uh, tiny cameras. So the quality was really good. So if you so if you were doing macro stuff, um, it, it, the pictures really came out well, even if, even though it was just three or four megapixels. So usually, so that so my first subjects obviously were you know the painted frogs and the garden lizards and the long leg uh, long legged flies uh, in my garden because I already knew those animals so well. 
So I knew how to approach them. I knew how to, you know, uh, handle the frogs and things like that. And such a and great way to start, right? I mean, starting yeah. with things you know yeah. when you know where they are, that's that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, that's the big thing about wildlife is, first of all, access to wildlife. Uh, you know, you can't become a wildlife filmmaker or photographer unless you have access to the animals and you know the animals uh, and their life size. So that way, like I said, they became the obvious choice for me. They became my first subjects. And um, in India, we used to have a magazine, we still have a magazine called Sanctuary Asia, uh, which is a wildlife uh, or conservation magazine uh, that covers Indian conservation issues and, and photographers and things like that. So there used to be a children's version of the magazine called Sanctuary Cub. And um, so I, my mom used to subscribe to that magazine because it was such an animal nut. And uh, I, could, I could start seeing very early on that <clears throat> the photographs that I was getting was on, on par to you know, professional macro photography or whatever was in the magazine. So it gave me sort of a, you know, a, a goal to reach to saying, hey, I can also do this. Uh, I can also you know, uh, do photography and things like that. And, and very early on, even though I'm not a technical person at all, I'm a very non-techie, non-gearhead person, uh, uh, I somehow just uh, consumed the camera's manual because I just wanted to know how you know the camera worked so that I could get the kind of photos that I wanted. Um, and uh, uh, internet also, uh, photography forums were all very early on. So it was just in the beginning where you could get access to you know different people online and uh, you know or if you put in the camera's model you could get you know uh, problems sorted and things like that so that's how it started out for me um, and then and then i went to college and then and then it you know went on to the next level yeah that's fascinating i love the fact that you you started so young i mean that, you know with the podcast we hear so many stories of people who either had no interest in getting into wildlife filmmaking at all <laughs> right um and fell into it and then people like yourself who knew right early on you had that bug and mm. um and you you yeah. took advantage of the wildlife you had around you which is so unbelievably important because i think it's a stumbling block for so many people especially as we get older yeah and we want to get into the industry, people see all of the natural history shows there are around, you know, and they think, well, I've got to go and film the wildebeest or I've got to go and film this to be recognized. And it's just so not true. You know, if you can, if you can take mm -hmm. advantage of what's around you, it's so important. Now, Shripad, you, you yeah. then, I know you went on and you had um, an accident that kind of turned everything around for you. I'm really interested in mm -hmm. this because um, I know that it, there was, you know, you had some conflict. I'm not sure if conflict's the right word, but you, I think your parents were probably thinking that you yeah. were going one way in your career yeah. and you were thinking <laughs> you were going the other way. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. So, um, uh, even from my schooling, you know, it was fairly, it was a fairly academic school. It was uh, at that time, even it was one of the best schools in India. So it was very academically oriented. So very little, you know, outdoor, uh, activities or you know sports or anything like that so uh, going into college it was also you know driven towards academia and I come from a family of uh, chartered accountants and businessmen so the the norm is to kind of go in the same route um, and uh, so my deal with my parents was that you know I'll do really well in college in whatever course you know you want me to study in commerce or accounting but uh, the time I get during my holidays and things like that I get to travel where I want I get to explore my photography so during my uh, three years of college, even though I was doing you know, uh, commerce and accounting and things like that, uh, weekends I would go for photography courses uh, where I would take up you know, three or four hour courses uh, during the weekends, Saturday and Sunday, and spend the time learning uh, photography properly. Uh, it, though it was not wildlife, it was, even though it was just normal photography, but I, I could technically uh, equip myself to handle a DSLR at that time. So I picked up, uh, so when I was in college, I picked up a, I think at that time it was like a Canon 40D and a Canon 400mm 5.6 lens, a fairly compact telephoto lens I still have now, uh, as a kind of a beginner kit to get started in bird photography because that was my first thing. I was absolutely fascinated with birds. And um, so when I started doing that uh, in college, I was able to travel a lot during, you know, during, in between semesters and things like that. I was able to explore. Uh, I joined nature photography club, uh, sorry, nature club and a photography club, two different things and started exploring, you know, uh, my country because India is full of wildlife. So I was, through these groups, I had sort of access, uh, you know, to forests, to places for, you know, a week at a time or 10 days at a time uh, when I had the time. 
so uh, and during that period three years i was um I was able to submit, you know, my photographs to competitions, uh, to wildlife photography competitions like the National History uh, National History Museum Wildlife Photographer of the Year, where I came in the semifinals and the finals. Often, very often, I think I I think I sent them I sent in photographs. I think for about four years, and all the four years I came very close. Though I didn't win, but uh, uh, I came very close. So that was very reassuring for me because it kind of uh, it and to my parents that you know that okay there is some uh, you know my my talent is not just uh, it's not my own affirmation it's like other people also appreciate right. what, you know the yeah. kind of things i'm doing uh and um, yeah and after that uh, the the fact that i was getting these kinds of uh, i was reaching the semifinals and the finals in these competitions kind of really gave me the confidence that yes this is this is it this is you know this is what i want to do uh but my parents uh, at the time wildlife filmmaking also was you know it was extremely weird or unheard of career choice because in India there's no real wildlife filmmaking industry at all. You you literally have like a handful of filmmakers in India who do this full time, and even and even them they kind of you know uh, even though they're freelancers they kind of do other stuff as well, apart from being a, uh, apart from being filmmakers. So it was a fairly unconventional and difficult choice, uh, especially for uh, you know I didn't have any background in it at all. So there's very lin- little information out there. There's very little. Uh, mentorship or anything to lead into filmmaking because I, I think even at that time which was I think around 2010 or 2011 uh, I think photography as a profession wildlife photography as a profession I think had kind of I think they were like even uh, in, at, at the very uh, you know at the very best level there's still only a handful of people who are doing uh, who are photographers not filmmakers filmmakers are still a wider uh, industry but photography sure. I think was extremely niche yeah so so it became clear to me that if I wanted to do something in this field, it has to be filmmaking. And, um, and filmmaking was a sort of natural extension from photography. And uh, so, yeah, so I was kind of, uh, I, was, I didn't know, what, uh, you know what, what the next step was. And uh, it was a time uh, after my uh, undergrad was over, it was time to do postgrad. So I decided to do something uh, related to environment and conservation or, or a similar field. Uh, but not necessarily wildlife filmmaking because you know my, <laughs> my parents are not really too keen about that. So I, I I took up a course called Carbon Management from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and uh, that was basically the corporate side of uh, you know uh, of uh, I, I would say environment and conservation. It's basically renewable energy and uh, carbon markets and uh, you know corporate policy in terms of uh, uh, carbon offsets and things like that. So that's what I studied. Um, and it was interesting because I get I got to uh, travel to the UK and I was able to meet up with so many other people over there. Uh, and right after that, um, I was I was able to land a work stint with the United Nations and actually work as a environmental professional, as as you would call them, um, and do some carbon footprinting work for I think the COP17 summit, which was happening at Durban uh, uh, during that time, 2011. So when I did that, I absolutely hated it because it was just sitting behind the desk and working like you know, 14 hours a day. And uh, I could very clearly see that my uh, seniors or my superiors who I used to work with had the same kind of life. So I could make out like if I continued doing this for another four or five years, uh, it's, my life is not going to change. It is going to be more right. of the same. Yeah. So, so uh, I decided at that time I'll come back to India and then kind of figure out what to do. Um, uh, and when I came back, I was uh, on the way to a job interview in a small town, actually, and that's why I was in a bus. Uh, and on the way, the bus met with a horrendous accident. Uh, the person sitting right next to me, you know, they lost their life on the spot. Oh. Not a scratch on me. And uh, in at that very moment, when I sort of saw, you know, uh, saw him lying on the road dead, it sort of hit me saying that, you know, it could have been me. You know, my life could have ended like that if right. I had just, you know, been three feet you know, on the, on the other side. So that really kind of flicked a switch in my head saying that, hey, it's now or never. You have to do it. You know, if you don't do it now, it's, it's, you're never gonna, it's never going to happen. So, or you're going to regret it basically, you know, if your life ends uh, like this abruptly. So I, that was a real, you know, uh, it was really turning, po- it was a big turning point in my life. And I said, screw everything else. I'm going to, I'm going to pursue what I want to do. So after that, after that, uh, uh, I was able to meet some really 
uh, nice people after that. And then I think my career as a wildlife filmmaker began after that incident. Wow. I, I mean, astonishing how it takes something so unbelievably dramatic to, mm. you know, sometimes change the course of our lives. Do you, do you think that if that accident hadn't have happened, where, where do you think you'd be now? I don't know. I probably would have become a filmmaker, but I think it would have taken me a couple of more years because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a, uh, extremely, I'm an extremely diplomatic person by nature. So I usually try to weigh the pros and cons of, you know, sure, oh, should sure. I do this? Should I do that? <laughs> and uh, sometimes being indecisive is not, it's not really great, especially if you're chasing a passion. Yeah. Uh, I think you really need to, you know, you should have the grit to follow your heart, I think, and uh, trust, uh, trust in the process and trust in your own talent of, you know, that you will succeed. So I think that's important. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, amazing to hear a story like that because I think, you know, th this industry is hard to break into. Um, I mean, in some ways now, I think, you know, people think different things. It's easier now in some ways because there's way more demand for natural history shows. But at the same time, there's a lot more people wanting to get into it. There's a lot more yeah. avenues in terms of distribution with YouTube and, you know, mm. uh, different ways to do it. Um, it, it's astonishing how, you, you know, one of the things I actually like to do when I'm trying to make big decisions in my life with, without having a near-death experience, right, is <laughs> it is really think about, though, you know, what it would feel like to be on my deathbed. And, you know, this is a mm. fairly standard thing to do, but mm. I, I, it works so well to look back on your life and think, wow, if I didn't do that, how upset yeah. would I be? You know, what would I think about mm. my life if I had taken the... Yeah potentially easy road i mean there's i wouldn't mm. say any road is easy but um but that that's amazing um I, I gosh there's so so much i could talk about that um in itself because because it is those moments i mean you know i had an epiphany when i was 20, mm. 20 about 21 22 similar age mm. um mm. where i looked into the eye of a whale shark when i was uh, mm. snorkeling with one and, um, it, you know, it, it changed my life and it made me amazing, understand yeah. why I wanted to work with wildlife. You know, there right. was just that moment slightly yeah. different to yours. But mm. but I, but I'm fascinated about this. I, I want to go back, first of all, because I want to ask mm. that you said that you were a member of organizations. So you were a member of a nature mm. organization and photography mm. organizations when you were younger. Yeah. How important do you think those were for you in your journey? I mean, if those hadn't existed do you think you'd still be where you are? Absolutely not, because um, so the organization that I was part of was the photography organization was called the Photographic Society of Madras. Uh, in fact, it's one of the second oldest photography societies in the world. I think the first one is in the US and the second one was started in Madras, the city I live in, uh, in India. And uh, it has like 180 or I think now it'll be 100 and almost 200 year old history of being a wow. photographic society and having yeah. people, uh, you know, in it. So, um, and, a, and a thing about these societies was that you had a lot of older people. Uh, um, so photography and, uh, you know, uh, being a naturalist or, you know, being interested in nature, usually people who are, uh, who do that were people who had already, uh, you know, completed most of their career and had the time, had the money to pursue their passion. So most of them were fairly older people, lots of doctors, lots of, uh, lots of uh, uh, professionals. Uh, so I had, had a great time, uh, you know, uh, spending time with them in the field and, you know, learning photography or, you know, going on trips with them because um, uh, whenever we would discuss, it's, I, at that time I was just 19. So I would be going out with a 60-year-old or a 70-year-old uh, with a camera and both of us would be kind of trying to figure out, you know, what's, you know, how this thing works or, We'd be trying to track some animal, uh, you know, in the jungle. So uh, I think at that time I spent a lot of time with a lot of older people in my uh, through these societies. So I I learned a lot, not just in terms of you know nature or photography. I, I got a lot of life experiences from them because they would just reminisce, it, uh, you know, reminisce about their days when they were young or you know when they went on a trip or you know screwed up badly in their life, took a bad life decision, bad business decision, and things like that. So. I, I grew a lot. <clears throat> I grew a lot in those couple of years, uh, in terms of a person as well as you know as a as a person who wants to uh, shoot or, or you know or be interested in, uh, in nature. Uh, thanks to those societies and uh, the nature society that I was part of is called Madras Naturalist Society. 
And uh, same thing, I was able to access uh, incredible uh, pieces of forest because uh, they were a recognized society by the government. So they had access to lots of uh, forests that usually that are not open to tourists. You could stay in uh, you know, a bungalow inside a forest, a government bungalow inside a, inside a forest, or you would get access to uh, forest guides that usually wouldn't come you know, even if you had gone as a tourist. So, um, and we would, and lots of interesting treks into parts of the forest that usually tourists didn't, uh, tourists didn't have access to. So that way, uh, you know, those three years with both of these societies, uh, I, I got a very comfortable base of, you know, what the jungle is, what wildlife is, what photography is, without having the pressure of being a professional in that field. Because I was studying at that time, and at the same time, I was just able to explore both of these aspects as a passion and not as a profession. So uh, my mind was kind of free and just kind of learning at that point and not really like, oh, now you're in this field, you have to perform, you have to deliver. I didn't have, I didn't have that during that time. It's only later where, where, I become a, where I became a professional where those aspects started to come in. I think that's wonderful because it, it really goes to show how important organizations can be. And, and I think for any aspiring wildlife filmmaker listening, you know, just connecting with local conservation groups or local photography groups or filmmaking groups. There's so yeah. many ways to do that now. And yeah. there are so many of these groups, whether it's birding groups or, you know, yeah. nature walk uh, groups, yeah. whatever it is, conservation groups, badger groups, fox groups, yeah. you name it. You know, certainly in the UK, I remember, you know, yeah. being so many groups like that. And, and having the access and being around like-minded people like you said you know yeah. and, and people who are older and you're learning life experience mm. as well as yeah. you know a whole bunch of other stuff um yeah. it, it's so important because i think it, it helps you nurture that seed that you're planting yeah and yeah. when you try and do it on your own it's hard it That's is really, really hard, really hard which yeah. is why your experience your near-death experience was <laughs> so uh, you know, so, I mean, I guess it's not a near death experience, but, uh, but, uh, yeah. you know, you were in an accident yeah. where mm. you could have died yeah. and yeah. that sign sealed and delivered it for you, understanding that life mm. is too short. So, yeah. so take us forward now, um, Shripad to after the accident and understanding you had to make a decision here. What, what was that decision like? You were going to an interview. Did you just quit that and think, no, this is it? H how did you then you know, move forward from there in wildlife filmmaking. So the funny, yeah, I think the funny thing was that after that incident happened, I caught the next bus and went to the job interview. And the job interview turned out to be such a absolute disappointment uh, that it kind of reaffirmed the fact that, you know, I should definitely quit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and um, uh, and I, I came back and, um, and, and uh, uh, when I was uh, in college, there was a there was a mentor who I had. His name was uh, Shekhar Dadatri. He's a pretty big um, uh, filmmaker in in in, in even the international space. He's been on the uh, uh, he's been the judge in panels on most uh, you know big wildlife uh, uh, competitions and and filmmaking uh, competitions. So he uh, he at that time uh, put me on. I mean, he basically had uh, uh, some info on somebody else doing. Uh, a workshop on DSLR filmmaking, you know, doing, making films on, uh, you know, Canon 5Ds or 7Ds in these cameras. And he just said, why don't you just go and, you know, uh, do a workshop, do this workshop. You might, it might, you might find it helpful because you're trying to learn filmmaking or trying to do things on your own. Why don't you just go and, you know, attend that workshop. So when I'd gone, uh, when I registered and went for the workshop, that's when I met the person who was doing the workshop, who was uh, Saruna Kumar, uh, who turned out to finally be you know, my mentor uh, after that, and then also my boss. So, uh, like I said, I, I was able to meet the right person at the right time, I would say, because after that, after that incident, I was kind of reeling to go, and immediately this happened, and, uh, uh, and that's when it sort of really took off for me, because uh, I was able to, uh, basically what happened was the workshop was for three days, and uh, it was, I think, the first one was just theory, the first day was theory, second day was uh, shooting and the third day was editing. So you kind of got to do uh, everything. You you kind of you conceptualize, uh, shoot, and then edit. So three days I was able to kind of see you know what what I could do uh, um, as a filmmaker, and then I just uh, I just gelled with uh, uh, with Sarah. So I could just uh, immediately find that oh this is you know this is the right place for me. And the next day I came back and said hey I just want to 
hang around you. You don't have to pay me or do anything. I'll just quietly, you know, stand in the corner and just see what you guys are doing. And he said, okay. <laughs> That's fantastic. I, I love the fact that when we commit to something, and I think this, so many people have had this uh, experience. When we, when we 100% commit something, the people we need turn up. They yeah, arrive, yeah. you know, when, when yeah. you've made that decision consciously, subconsciously, it's just part of your being, yeah. the, the things start happening um, and the yes, right people turn up. I agree up. with that, yeah. Mm. So, so now um, you and, um, and I'm going to get Sarah. that pronunciation really bad, Sarah. So, and I've mm. seen with um, Evanescence, I think is the name of the studio yeah. you, you guys work yeah. with. Um, and it's S-A-R-A, -A, which we would say Sarah. Yeah, yeah Sarah, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so... You and he have now, you work on projects, which I, I, I think are mostly for NGOs. Is that right? Conservation groups yeah. in India? Yeah, a lot of them are for NGOs. And that's, that's more of the wildlife stuff. And uh, uh, we, we also do a lot of uh, work with lots of corporate brands as well. But uh, we're kind of known for uh, our wildlife films with, with wildlife conservation NGOs. So that's kind of our, uh, our thing. Wonderful. So, and, and yeah. I've got to, I'm, I'm going to have to just say for our listeners, I've just had to put a cough sweet in <laughs> because I have such a tickly, scratchy throat. I'm going to cough all the way through this. So excuse me if I sound funny with a cough sweet in my mouth at this point. Um, apologies. Carry on. So uh, so what happened after that was um, um, there, there was me and then there were two other young guys who who were, who were doing their uh, visual communication courses as a part of their college. And uh, they were interning with uh, Sarah at that time. And Sarah had just finished uh, uh, two large projects, uh, one with the BBC and one uh, with National Geographic. And, uh, uh, they were, and he was the DOP on both of, both of those films. So he was kind of, uh, he, he had a, a large amount of experience that he could pass on, you know, to all these young guys who, who, who were kind of interning with him. And uh, at that time, Evanescence didn't really exist. Uh, it didn't exist. So uh, only, I think, about a, six months after that, we kind of figured out that we had enough people to kind of, and all of us had the same kind of vision to kind of make films and kind of do it. So then at that time, Evanescence was started, and then we started making films, all these, all these different kinds of films that uh, I, I, spoke, I spoke to you about. Um, and, um, yeah, so after that, we started making films for, yeah, go on. Well, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, what one of the things that's so admirable is the fact that there is very little industry in the, mm. in the wildlife filmmaking genre in India, yeah. and yet you still manage to carve out a niche for yourself. Mm. You know, you manage to find a way into it, which is astonishing because it can be, you know, even when you're in a country where there is an industry, it can mm. be hard to do. It's so much harder where you are. Yeah, I, I think I think that's, that's sort of... Uh... I'm sure other countries, um, there are other countries that don't have this kind of wildlife uh, industry in it. And the thing is, India has a lot of wildlife, but it doesn't have an industry. So it's kind of ironic because you have, yeah. you have the animals, you have, you have uh, fairly you know, good access to forests, but there's no... And, and, the, and the thing is, there's a huge audience that consumes uh, nature television. You know, people love animals. They really, uh, they really love these uh, programs and films they see on Nat Geo and Discovery. And... But yet, uh, uh, the biggest uh, film industry is still the commercial or, you know, the fiction film industry. That's an enormous yeah. industry here in India. But uh, right. when it comes Bollywood, to document, right? yeah. So you have, yeah. you have uh, news television and you have films. You don't have uh, documentaries and uh, uh, wildlife documentaries at all. You don't have that industry at all. Wow. So, so that, most that's of, amazing. Mm, so, most of, so most of the films... Uh, that's been the trend. Now, I guess now it's changing a little bit, but most of the films that are made, uh, you know, where you have, you know, uh, films on Indian tigers or uh, other things, it's usually shot by cameramen that's come in from the US or the UK uh, as part yeah. of production, and then they shoot here and then they go. And uh, I think people who have kind of come up in the industry here have been people who have worked on these kinds of films uh, and assisted these cameramen and kind of then built a reputation for being a sequence cameraman or you know, uh, the production companies contacted them to kind of shoot just one part of it, which they missed out, or something like that. So every so everybody who's uh, who's currently working has some kind of story like that, where they've got a break, uh, uh, you know, through one some reason or the other, and they had the opportunity to kind of start making, uh, start shooting, and then that's kind of led to more projects later. 
So, um, so I think that way, um, uh, uh, Evanescence Studios at the time, I think, was kind of unique because I think even now there's no real um, uh, studio or a production house that makes wildlife documentaries. Uh, not, uh, when I say wildlife documentaries, it's not just for channels. It's also for uh, in independent clients in India. So, which, yeah. um, which I guess... Uh, uh, there, there are not too many companies that do that, is what I'm trying to say. No, and, mm. it, and you know, I find that fascinating because it's such a big um, potential mm. industry there. Um, certainly, I've done a lot of them for NGOs and uh, charitable companies, you know, conservation groups. And, mm. and most of the time, and I, I really try and push this to people who ask me for advice, and that is that rather than just trying to pitch over and over to network TV, mm. why not approach these groups and mm. say, look, you know, I'll make you something <clears throat> pro bono, right? Free of mm. charge to help you with your organization and help me get a film made yeah. and something I can use on my reel or yeah. ask for expenses. Yeah. I certainly did that in the early days of yeah. just getting expenses so that they're getting something much, much cheaper yeah. that they can afford. And that helps you. And then, uh, you know, there are certainly people in this industry who make a living from just making NGO style Correct. films. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I think uh, given the way technology was uh, was sort of uh, developing at that time in terms of DSLR filmmaking and the fact that you, you could kind of edit these, uh, you know, fairly easy and light H.264 files on your laptop, uh, you didn't need a, a huge investment to start, you know, a film studio or something like that. You just needed a camera, uh, a good set of, <laughs> a good pair of tripod, and and a laptop. That's it. And you just had to get creative after that. So, <laughs> uh, so that way. And that's that's the thing. The yeah. creativity is yeah. what it's all about, yeah. right? You you think you get the gear and it's all going to be good, but you actually have to know what you're doing <laughs> after that point, right? So so we could offer that value proposition to you know uh, to the ngos that came to us because it was possible to make uh, you know these films at a fairly low cost because even ngos don't have like kind of television uh, budgets they have they have a yeah. fairly small budget for marketing and they want to use that for, when they want to use that for films then we have to give them uh, you know as much as possible because uh, they're usually doing that once in 10 years or once in five years mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to spend that kind of money uh, every year to you know, to make a film so it's it, it's usually about you know the work that they've been doing for the last five years and where they're going uh, so it's so if you if you do that kind of film for them uh, it might happen once for that client so after that it's also a question yeah. of finding another client who's who has that kind of requirement after that so yeah absolutely yeah so it's uh, yeah it, it was lots of uh, lots of interesting projects that way came about. We did a film about, uh, 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 so an organization that we work, work for very often is called Nature Conservation Foundation. And they have uh, wildlife conservation projects all over India, across various habitats, across, uh, uh, they even do underwater projects in the Andamans and things like that. So, uh, um, so we were able to work on lots of different kinds of uh, wildlife and different kinds of uh, films for them. So we did a film on elephants for them and then, uh, with, an, with another NGO, we were able to do a film uh, uh, with the Croc Bank, the Madras Crocodile Bank, which is a fairly well-known uh, you know, reptile research center and, and park. So uh, for them, we did a lot of film about uh, snakes. Um, uh, you know, most uh, four deadly snakes of India is one film that uh, was, was was a film that we did for them, which sort of it was really targeted towards the. Uh, villages of India and the people uh, uh, in the villages of India. So it got translated into lots of different languages and was distributed uh, all throughout as a part of their kind of outreach program. And it spoke about, uh, you know, the four most common snakes that kill people. So the cobra, the crate, the Russell's viper and saw scale viper. So it was about how people encounter these snakes, uh, how people get bitten and then what you can do to, you know, keep the snakes uh, away from your house. We'll be right back. I recently got introduced to Athletic Greens as a way to optimize for better gut health, get more energy, and optimize the immune system. 
So what is this stuff? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging. It's a lifestyle-friendly brand, which means whether you're eating keto or paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, it's going to work for you. It contains less than one gram of sugar. There's no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good. And for every purchase, Athletic Greens is going to donate to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry here in the U.S. In fact, in 2020 alone, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. And not only that, Athletic Greens is a climate neutral certified company. Again, in 2020, Athletic Greens purchased carbon credits to support projects protecting old growth rainforests. That's huge. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with the convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. So to make it easy... Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do to get this deal is visit athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging. That's E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash emerging to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Now back to the show. I, I love that. I just want to talk a bit about that one because um, it's such a great example of how a, a, a charitable organization or an NGO can use a film mm. so effectively. It's not just there to be like, oh, this is what we do. Yeah. This is where we spend your money. Yeah. It's actually being out there as a... a, um, a a PSA, if you like, yeah. to the public to say, hey, this, these, these are out there. People are dying from them. Yeah. We can stop this by doing just a few yeah. uh, simple things. Exactly. So, so you filmed, you were director of photography on mm. that one. Tell us a little bit about how, I know watching it, you, you know, you got pretty close to a lot of those snakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, t tell me a bit about what that was like from a point of view of, I mean, tell, first of all, tell us what you were filming on, because obviously yeah. gear is so instrumental to this yeah because i think if you have a cn 20 50 to a thousand mil you, you can stay far away yeah. right I'm, I'm assuming you didn't have that so how close were you to these snakes and what were you filming on so um i think the first film that we did uh, which was in 2013 or 14 was shot on a 5d mark ii uh, the, the film on elephants that we did called living with elephants uh, that was the first film as a company and uh, we shot that mostly on a 5D and a ca usual Canon 24, 105, 16, 35, a uh, bunch of lenses. And um, after that, I think we switched over to the Sony mirrorless bodies. I think we had the Sony A7S, the first generation A7S. And that uh, gave us a lot of low light um, capability uh, of shooting so that because we were shooting crates. So if you want to shoot a snake that's nocturnal, uh, you need to shoot in the night and kind of show, you know, it going crawling along walls and you know dimly lit situations and things like that. So uh, that's what we used for the film predominantly. We used a Sony A7S and regular Canon lenses. I think we just had an adapter that went from the Canon EF mount to E mount, and we just adapted regular Canon, you know, 100 100 macro, uh, and uh, for the all for the, uh, the people bits we used regular 24 and 5 70-200s. And that's it. We didn't need big telephoto lenses, but we used a lot of macro lenses for this. So I think at that time, we didn't have the uh, the MPE, the 5X macro. We didn't have that. But anyway, with snakes, you didn't, you, there was no need to get that close to them. Uh, sure. <laughs> in fact, you needed to maintain a little bit of distance because, <laughs> uh, because the soft tail wiper and the Russell's wiper are two extremely scary snakes. Um, and especially with the Russell's wiper, you can't, it's extremely unsafe to get close to them because they, they have a pretty big uh, strike distance as well. And uh, uh, so we were, we, 
we use the 100 micro, but we use them on different, uh, like we had a small jib that we used it on. So we, we got interesting shots where we could get a top-down shot of the snake kind of moving around. Uh, shots that you would, probably wouldn't get with uh, any other kind of rig. But because the camera was small and we had kind of a, I think we had a Kessler pocket jib or something like that. It's All these things were new at that time because they were all they all came out of yeah. the DSLR filmmaking uh, uh, yeah. uh, revolution. So lots of interesting, quite cinematic, uh, you know, angles we could get, but it's all just small, tiny setups. So, uh, so that way that film was... But which is fantastic yeah. because I, I know from um, just, you know, reading some of your stuff beforehand mm. that before I saw it, that you were filming on DSLRs mm. and had smaller rigs. And yet it's a beautifully shot film. It looks, you, you know, if you're watching it and you had no idea, mm. you you couldn't tell what you shot on. It's yeah. beautiful. It, it's really nice. And it just goes, it's a great example of how you can use smaller cameras yeah. to get really cinematic looking yeah. shots. And, and, uh, and the thing is that I think at that time, professional films were still being shot on, you know, I think, uh, one third chip or one inch uh, sensor cameras, the proper professional rigs. But the thing is, you had really huge lenses, which took advantage of that. Uh, so when we shot on a 5D or an A7, because it had that full frame look, whatever you shot, even though it was just like 1080 or something like that, it still looked, uh, it looked cinematic. It looked amazing straight out of the camera. So we could really make use of that uh, in terms of uh, even when we shot the people sequences, you know, of the shots of the snakes and kind of going towards a person who's just washing uh, vessels and things like that. So we have, uh, the film was kind of built uh, kind of the horror thing in mind because you wanted to kind of show people, you know, that's 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 the perspective that people have, you know, that snakes kind of can creep up yeah. onto you. And uh, we also didn't make up those scenes because uh, based on the statistics that the researchers had got, we found that these are the ways people get bitten. So we had to demonstrate that in a way that's... Uh, uh, people, you know, people consume films, so they're always kind of uh, they're used to seeing cinematic images. So, but when it comes to documentaries, when you talk, when you say if you're a documentary filmmaker, people assume that it's kind of you know boring documentaries. We kind of wanted to break right. that, so we shot yeah. all the sequences of people also kind of cinematically, so that it looks, you know, people are get engrossed in 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 the film. Yeah. And you did a marvelous job Thank of it. You. I mean, it's beautiful. And um, I mean, all of your films are. And I'm, I'm going to link to all of those films on our website, on your episode web page, sure. so you. that uh, people can go and, and watch them. Um, they're really, really well done. And I, I just, you, you know, I think the fact that you were able to carve out this niche, mm. you and Evanescence uh, Studios or Productions were able to carve out the niche of working for these NGOs and make these kind of films, but rather than just, you know, it's so easy with those kind of productions, mm. especially when they're not high budget, mm. is to, to, to go, you know what, I'm just going to get this done as we, we, we just get, <laughs> let's knock this out as quick yeah. as we can, right? Let's just get it shot. We've got to shoot some people washing dishes <laughs> and the snakes, you know, coming up to them. Let's just get it done. But rather than doing that, taking the time to do it beautifully and cinematically so that you have this portfolio mm. piece and a piece that, you know, what I, I, I know is happening at the moment with this, you know, new trend of um, of natural history shows just, you know, being on demand mm. everywhere. Mm. I mean, all streaming services, there's so many productions going mm. on that production houses, networks are now looking for you know dps all around the world mm. that are used to the wildlife that's around mm. them because so much of the time when you take a, a dp out of the uk or the us or wherever and you send them abroad if they've had no experience with those animals mm. it's much harder to yeah. get the shots and then you've got to hire other experts to be with mm. them and and so these days you know by you having uh, all of these reels and showing the wildlife you've worked with and how beautifully you're mm. shooting, I think it's it's a really good piece to show yeah. networks that you're there. Now, I know you've worked on, I think you've worked on 72 Dangerous yeah. Animals. Yeah. Was that a uh, Netflix? Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us a bit about the, net, so, the, uh, the network TV stuff. So um, that was um, I think a couple of four seems time seems so distraught with this covid thing but i think it was like four four years yeah. ago <laughs> i think it was about uh, around four years ago and uh, uh i 
in fact, uh, uh, for that one, I had shot a small uh, section where we speak about the Indian red scorpion, I think, uh, which, is, which is a really tiny scorpion that, uh, that we have here in India. And it's pretty common around, uh, even here, you know, on the outskirts of the cities and things like that. And in, uh, and in villages where you have kind of thatched roofs, where it's just straw roofs or it's uh, clay roofs, and usually scorpions find, uh, that particular species of scorpion find those places really nice to kind of, uh, uh, you know, spend the time during the day when it's really hot and they come out at night. And people kind of get bitten or step on them, uh, you know, and that's, that's what happens. So, so do they do they come out of the roof and drop down inside the house, or are they dropping down outside? What, Both, in the sense, um, uh, I've heard stories from my own from my own family. You know, when uh, I mean, from one or two generations ago, when they used to have clay roofs in the villages, uh, used to have you know scorpions were a problem. So uh, whenever you kind of go out in the night, you have to be you know wary of uh, scorpions and snakes. So <laughs> it's it, yeah. uh, I think it's it's part of uh, I think living. Uh, in, in villages in India, so that's why sure. that's why it's 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 part of the seventy two dangerous uh, Asia seventy two dangerous animals list because people do encounter them and people do get bitten. So um, yeah. so I shot uh, a small sequence where you have uh, where you kind of profile the scorpion. You have different shots of it kind of moving around and things like that. We we built a small set uh, within our own studio uh, because it's just easier to uh, kind of shoot around it. And that's the only way you could get get sure. eye level shots of the scorpion because it's like tiny. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, to show how it kind of hides, you know, underneath uh, small pieces of tree bark and things like that. So it was fun because uh, shooting macro is always fun. It's extremely challenging, but it's always fun because you kind of have to you have to do so many things to make it work right. Uh, and um, yeah. Uh, and when you get it right, it's it's always extremely satisfying. It's like shooting uh, time lapses. It, time lapses is also very similar similar to that because uh, you kind of have to set up your frame, see how fast the clouds are moving, set your shutter speed accordingly, and then when you kind of finally uh, when you preview it, it's like magical. Oh wow! Okay, I just spent forty minutes just getting yeah. one shot, but it's extremely satisfying. <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, that's the thing about pre-production yeah. that when when you do the pre-production up front you spend the time prepping and getting ready mm. it's so satisfying when it works it doesn't always work yeah right sometimes especially with time that's the fun I've thing about it right times yeah. when i've set up and <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. i mean that's it you you do the best you can at the time yeah. I, I was just on a shoot recently where i, I filmed multiple mm. time lapses and you know a lot of them the weather changed yeah. halfway through and it didn't do yeah. what i hoped so, it was going to do and you know, it's just... It so is that was it another is. production that I did for uh, National Geographic for a series called Hostile Planet. I think it was uh, hosted by Bear Grylls, but it was being shot all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I shot yeah. the uh, India portion of, of that of that film. I think it was for a particular episode called I think Forest. Or something. I don't recall which exactly, where which, which episode it came up in, sure. but it was basically shots of uh, sort of turbulent skies. Uh, uh, I think as a part of the Hostile Planet, they wanted lots of time lapses of clouds moving, monsoon clouds coming in, lightning strikes and things like that. So uh, uh, I spent 12 days in uh, Meghalaya, which is in the northeast corner of India, which is on the border of Bangladesh, uh, just looking up like for 12 days and driving around because it's just chasing clouds and doing time lapses. So uh, I had like a motion a motion control time lapse uh, system. I think it was a sit up, sit up uh, genie system, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, I spent like twelve days. Oh yeah, the syrup genie. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, yeah. So you kind of tie uh, tie up one end of the slider with it, and kind of moves along. Mm -hmm. Extremely, it's, it's an extremely good sli uh, motion control system. And um, uh, yeah, I spent like twelve days just looking up, uh, uh, driving around, looking up, and shooting time lapses. And uh, and what would happen is I would spend most of the day doing that, and then in the night because we also had to shoot lightning storms. We would then take uh, the Wary cam out and then shoot uh, lightning storms in the night. And uh, we were working. I remember we were working with a producer in the UK, who was who had sent me a who had sent me I think a, a, a sort of a weather forecast saying you're going to have lightning storms in these ten days. And then there was no lightning storms at all, and <laughs> absolutely nothing. <laughs> right. And then yeah. I, and then yeah. I told and then uh, I think it was the tenth day and. We, uh, I told the producer, see, we, we have absolutely nothing. We spent 10 days here, yeah. and we have no lightning. And then uh, he said, uh, 
can you stretch it for another two days you know send me the budget you know how, how much it's going to cost if you're going to stretch it and send them the budget and then he said okay you have like sure. you have two more days if you can get it you get it right. and then that night and that yeah. night we had like a huge lightning storm i think we were able to film a lot of lightning strikes and things like that and i shot from i think i shot the i had shot time lapses the whole day from five in the morning and then the lightning storm started at about nine in the night and it went on till five in the morning so i was like completely dead by the time we finished shooting the whole thing yeah and yeah so after isn't it yeah. amazing how many times it's the 11th <laughs> hour that you get the yeah. stuff you yeah. need uh yeah so yeah so um I remember being extremely tired, but I was so excited that, you know, you know, we had finally like 11 days of searching and hunting for this thing. We had finally, we had finally, at least it happened. And then what I got finally was a different thing, but, uh, but it, uh, we could at least find the lightning storm and, and shoot it. So yeah, that was, that was another thing that we did. Mm. Sure. How long was that in the final show? Was that, uh, was it just yeah, a few seconds or did you do a no, sequence? It was just, yeah. Okay. So you... so the 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 thing is, we were we were not shooting a sequence of a, a certain location. We were getting we were grabbing different kinds of shots as much variety as possible. So I think I think the shots were used yeah. across the show. I think it was not just used in one one part sure. of the film. So so yeah. Um, so yeah. So I think that I think we have to watch the whole series to see where all my shots are. <laughs> to see, yeah yeah absolutely uh, again it's a great example though um you know we just had something very similar recently on a shoot where you know remote producers mm. are trying their hardest to predict with the information they have but you know so much of the time in mountainous mm. areas in these vast open areas weather is so absolutely. changeable and it can be so localized absolutely where you can literally have a, a snowstorm yeah. over here and yeah, bright yeah, sunshine yeah. over here, you know, to your right and left. And uh, the weather forecast, of course, is telling you mm. one thing, and that's what people mm. think they're getting. Um, you know, that's why it's so important to have good people on the ground who know the area, mm. know how it works and know, okay, we need to go here yeah. if we want that because it's not yeah. happening over here. Uh, so very important. Yeah, and I think, that, I think, I think so, even on um, uh, the fact that you said to rely on local help because... Meghalaya is like thousands of kilometers from where I stay. So it's, uh, you know, to we were totally reliant on, you know, a driver and a local guide who kind of said, okay, this is what you're looking for. I'll go find this out for you. Or, or I'll send him off on a scout saying, you know, just go look at this, get some photos on, you know, on your cell phone and get back to me. By the time I'll be shooting something else and you report back to me and let's see whether we can you know, do that the next day or something like that. So it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm. super important. Because otherwise, as you say, I mean, you're you're local to the area, or or you're, you're not necessarily yeah, local to that exactly. particular area, but you had other mm. local people with you. But you you lost ten days of a ten day <laughs> shoot because yeah. it wasn't happening. And so being then able to rely on, okay, we know it's yeah. going to happen here, or yeah. if we move here, or if we wait one more day, or mm. whatever it might be, um, is so very yeah. very important. So. Shripad, what what now? Where what are your um what what do you look at for the future of kind of Evanescence and your career? What are you so, hoping to um, do? So in 2020, I became a dad and I wanted more time with my family. So I I kind of told Sarah that I'm going to kind of take off and do uh, things on my own as well because my uh, uh, all throughout the, the eight years that I was working with Evanescence, as we were doing lots of wildlife stuff, we were also doing lots of commercial stuff as well. We were doing we were working with corporates and we were working sure. with uh, brands to make tourism films. We were doing corporate films. We were doing CSR films. We were doing fundraising films. We we did a lot of a lot of different kinds of films. Uh, uh, while I, yeah, so important to be able to earn a living on a on a yeah. full time basis. And right? um, and I think an interesting thing that happened at the time was there was a lot of cross learning because uh, in wildlife you really build on stamina. You build on focus. You build on kind of, uh, you know, hyper planning a shoot. Uh, whereas on corporate shoots, you're just kind of looking at making every image look good, you know, getting the right, uh, getting the right audio, getting lots of different, so, so you learn a lot of things from different kinds of films and you can always apply that. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of, uh, like for example, when I initially started doing wildlife, I really didn't care about people. I don't care about how people looked on camera or anything like that. I was only, only focused on, <laughs> I was only focused right. on the wildlife. So, yeah. whereas when we started shooting uh, commercial stuff where, you know, it was just people and the locations, 
I very quickly learned that you know unless you show people re- really well, it's not going to work out. So uh, I think there was a very dist- there was a very right. distinct change you know after I did a couple of corporate films where I started lighting people better or started framing them better in the in my wildlife work when I was when whenever people were involved, uh, you know that was the learning from from the corporate world. So I think that way it's very it's it was it was it's very interesting that you know the the learning happens you know from from different kinds of films. Yeah. Yeah. And it's easier to get that kind of corporate work mm. as well. So I encourage anyone when when people are saying to me, you know, I just I can't afford to be out there with my camera mm. trying to film wildlife. I said, well, look at corporate jobs, you know, music videos, uh, adverts, commercials, yeah. those kind of things, because you do. There is yeah. so much crossover. And I've done the same thing. I filmed a lot of commercials and, you know, all sorts of other documentary mm. style um, films that you do learn these little techniques that you bring over with you and go, you know, that's yeah. going to enhance yeah. what I do over here in the wildlife Absolutely. genre. And so you, be- you became a dad recently. How has that changed your, you know, just your day-to-day yeah. life with filmmaking? Because, I mean, filmmaking, wildlife filmmaking, we're out in the field mm. a lot, right? I mean, we, the idea is you're out there, you're waiting for behavior. Yeah. Uh, and when you have kids, yeah, you miss all the behavior all happening at home. <laughs> Right, exactly. You're either missing behavior at yeah. home or in the wild. Yeah. It's one or the other. So I think in terms of uh, professionally, that's what happened. I, I, I left ever since. I don't work with them full time anymore, even though I still uh, you know, work on projects when I'm called for uh, on a project basis. You know, whenever there's a shoot or something like that, I would go. Uh, but now in the last two years, since everything was locked down and we couldn't really go out and things like that, I just made use of uh, you know uh, the hundreds of courses that you have online nowadays on on uh, film lighting and things like that. So my interest also kind of shifted towards uh, the commercial aspects of cinematography, uh, where, uh, where uh, see, uh, I did, I've done wildlife like very seriously for eight years. And after a certain point as the DOP, you kind of want control over certain things and you can't get that in wildlife all the time. You're kind of at the mercy of, of the animal, sure. you yeah. know, what's happening on ground, uh, schedules and things like that. So uh, as a, as a DOP, when you when you kind of evolve into wanting more control, uh, then you have to go into uh, you know ads or you have to go into fiction and things like that. And uh, I've always done those kinds of films in the past as well, so it's not very alien to me. Uh, so and uh, like I said, India is it has a huge film industry and has a huge ad industry. So it would be foolish, you know, having this large skill set but not making use of it, you know, to make a couple of ads a month and kind of being comfortable doing that. Uh, apart from doing apart from doing the wildlife yeah, stuff, yeah. so I've been I've been kind of uh, doing a lot of online courses, working with other DOPs here in the film industry, honing my skills as an advertisement cameraman, and also trying to become a feature film cameraman as such, where you focus more on the lighting, on working with grips, uh, uh, working with directors, working with actors, and things like that. And um, yeah, and it's been really it's been really good in the sense I've, I have gotten a couple of projects. I, my documentary work still continues. I still keep getting documentary offers, uh, you know, to do films, human interest films, uh, NGO work, and things like that. But uh, I want to kind of focus. Currently, I have been focusing on doing commercial stuff, but I still want to keep my roots in wildlife. I don't want to leave that because uh, that's still my primary kind of, you know, uh, it really keeps me going. So I, um, the funny thing is, because I've been with Evanescence for eight years, I've never had to look for work. Work always came our way. So now yeah. after yeah. You know, after eight years, I'm in, a, I'm in a situation where I have a huge body of work, but uh, nobody knows who I am. <laughs> in, in, yeah, yeah uh, nobody knows who yeah. I am in terms of you know even even within the Indian film industry here in the in the uh, wildlife. Yes, they do, but internationally, I I haven't reached out to anybody at all because I never had to. So that's so sure. that's something that I want to yeah. change because uh, uh, I think. In a lot of your uh, podcasts, like uh, you rightly said with your other guests, that unless you put yourself out there, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to get the work. It's not going to come to you. Yeah. No, that's right. It doesn't. It doesn't just appear. Even if you've been in yeah. the industry for decades, um, you still have to maintain your mm. network of people and and be in connection yeah. with them constantly. Because here's the thing: even if you're a freelancer. No one knows your schedule, right? No one knows where yeah. you are and what you're doing. So unless you reach out on a regular basis and say, hey, here I am, I've, I'm doing this, but I'm free from you know, June mm. to August, 
you know, there's a window there if you need someone. Or, you, you know, it, it, most of the camera people in this industry yeah. are freelancers and they're taken on project to project and unless you keep that going. So I think it's a really good, you know, I, I've said this many times to uh, aspiring filmmakers about utilizing the corporate mm. world to keep a camera yeah. in your hands. And if you could, rather than going and working, you know, in a d accounting job or another job behind a desk or whatever it might be, a carpenter or a Starbucks yeah. or whatever, right? Being able to keep a camera in your hands, you're Absolutely. constantly learning. And I bet you are now, you know, looking to move yeah. into all these other areas. And you're going to learn something that when you make your yeah. next wildlife film, it's going to make it that yeah. much extra special. Shripad, this is, you know, it's been fascinating to talk to you. I, I love um, your journey and, uh, you know, where it's taken you. Um, if you, just mm. to close out, if you had to give one piece of advice, you know, I, the fact that you, you know, carved out this niche in a place where it was extremely hard to do that. If you had to give advice to anyone, wherever they are in the world, they're just looking to get into wildlife filmmaking, uh, the start of it, what, what would that be? I think it would just, uh, I think the advice that I got uh, very early on was uh, when I was in school, uh, I still wanted to go out shoot a lot of wildlife when I was young, but uh, I was, uh, my parents really didn't think it was a good idea for you know, a school kid to go around uh, roaming around forests trying to look for tigers or elephants. So, so at that time, my mentor told me that just shoot the wildlife that you have around you. So, for example, uh, uh, there were lots of crows, lots of squirrels, uh, lots of small wildlife around around a house and access that you can access within the city. Um, so uh, that's what I ended up doing. I, I just kept shooting crows. I kept shooting squirrels every day. And what happened was my skills were... I think you you were known yeah. as the crow guy, weren't you? I think I heard this somewhere else. <laughs> so, um, so I yeah, I ended up having a, a lot of interesting photographs of crows because no one had spent so much time shooting crows. Uh, um, and what ended up happening happening was my skills were extremely honed for shooting birds and fast moving small uh, small animals. So whenever I had the opportunity to go shoot wildlife in a forest, you know, when I was in college and things like that. It was not new to me. I knew exactly how you know birds would fly. I knew exactly how small mammals would react. I knew my settings. I knew everything. So I went there, you know, prepped to shoot wildlife. But I just prepped on you know smaller wildlife within within uh, within my house. So I think that's I think that's very important. I think you shouldn't kind of hold back saying, oh, I want to shoot great white sharks. I'll not shoot anything else. Just shoot anything that you have access to. Or you, I want to shoot tigers, so I'll not shoot anything. I'll go to the jungle and then shoot tigers there and learn. No. Just shoot anything. Shoot dogs, shoot cats, shoot any birds, shoot anything that you have access to. Make a film or make a reel about, you know, their life. You know, put together a one-minute sequence about your cat's life. Put a one-minute sequence, uh, put a one-minute sequence together about your dog's life. Or try to tell a story about, you know, uh, from your dog's perspective, like a first-person view of your dog or something like that. Just basically, because the skills are the same. Filmmaking is, the language is the same. You just have to exercise it. It's like a muscle. You need to keep exercising it for you to keep developing uh, you know, those skills. And uh, the only difference is the subjects keeps changing. That's it. One day you're shooting tigers. One day you're shooting yeah, wildebeest. Yeah. One day you're shooting great white sharks. One day you're shooting whale sharks. It, but the, the person behind the camera is exactly doing the same thing. They're setting the right exposure, setting the right composition. They're, they're, telling, uh, they're getting the shots for sequences. And sequences are universal. They have a, a starting shot. They have a middle. And they have an end. So just keep practicing that no matter where you are what you do that's so so important because the one thing i think that people don't see when they're dreaming about going and filming tigers in india is that if they don't have the muscle memory that it takes to get the right shots is that you get so overwhelmed yeah. with yeah. like uh, you know you're so amazed you're so in awe of this incredible yeah. creature that's in front of you that it actually becomes quite hard unless yeah. you've had all of that experience yeah. to get the shots and if you mess those shots up at that point then that's kind of you know it's the it's a yeah. downward spiral at that point right you've got to have yeah. the other stuff honed so when yeah. you're in front of a tiger and you've got to think about safety and getting yeah. the shot and the sequence and that you can do so it because times, you've yeah. done it so many times. I think that's such valuable advice. That's awesome. Shripad, where can people find you if they want to follow uh, you I'm online? I'm on Instagram as at Shripad Shridhar. And uh, so that's S-R-I-P-A-D-S-R-I-D-H-A-R. And uh, 
I have a website as well, which has a lot of my work there, which is the same. It's just shripathsridhar.com. So, uh, I, and I think I need to start, uh, you know, my social media game is extremely bad, very poor. But I need to really improve on that because that's where the world is going. So, yeah, that's a, you'll <laughs> join me on that one. So. <laughs> um, well, wonderful. I'll put links to uh, your Instagram, your, uh, your website, but also yeah. to the films yeah, that you that's... sent me as well. Um, so people can see your work because, uh, and so basically those will be on jakewillers.com forward slash podcast under Shripad's uh, episode page. You'll find the links there. Uh, I did also see the one you shot on uh, Tigers and we didn't mm. get to speak about that. But um, yeah, I mean, again, beautiful work. Um, you shot some incredible. We could do another version, version two of the podcast wildlife. for these films. <laughs> that's right yeah yeah part two uh tigers <laughs> and other dangerous wildlife um yeah no that sounds wonderful just just to, just because mm. i'm fascinated now how long did you spend in the field with tigers these yeah, were wild uh, tigers that, right again that film was for another ngo it was for a film co uh, for an ngo called tracked uh tiger research and something something i don't remember exactly what it's called but it's an ngo yeah, uh, right. in uh, Maharashtra that does uh uh, research on tigers. Um, there's a there's a wildlife sanctuary called Taroba Wildlife Sanctuary, and uh, uh, it's 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 in central and western India, um, and it's an extremely popular place to uh, watch tigers. And uh, but it's also an area where you have a, a huge man-animal conflict happening. So you have you have the park, and then you have a very large buffer zone. Uh, where you have people going into the forest to collect firewood and things like that. So the film uh, kind of explores the journey of two uh, of two tiger scientists over there, who found out that most of the tigers kind of um, come out into the, into the buffer zone and you know make that their home and are constantly in uh, in conflict with people. And how they solved that issue, how they recognized it, and how they solved it along with the people there, is what the film is about. So. Um, um, I think we didn't spend a lot of time because their research and the kind of techniques they used to kind of the detective work they did and you know the, the, how they solved the problem is is what the film is about. Uh, we didn't spend a, we didn't spend a lot of time shooting sure. tigers because that was not important for the film. We, it's, it was important that we got a couple of shots, but uh, yeah. it was important about uh, how uh, like in the in film we have lots of sequences where we have a POV for tiger attacking people. And things like that. So that's where, again, it's a little bit of, it's, it's more cinematic than your usual documentary. Yeah, it's mm. more kind of more some Bollywood in no. there, right? <laughs> um, they're, no, they're not dancing. They're not dancing, I guess. Um, I, I think it's a great example, actually, of how you can make a wildlife film, but it's mm. more human-centric. It's about the, the yeah. things that the people are having to deal with, but the wildlife's there in the background and, and, and yeah. it's still a wildlife show, so... Awesome. I'll put a link again for that in uh, on the podcast page as well so people can Absolutely. get to see that on YouTube. Shripad, thank, thank, you, thank you, so you so much, much for taking the time out. I know it's super late there. Um, you've got to get to bed. So uh, thank, thank you. you so I appreciate you being here. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please consider leaving a rating and a comment. And subscribe if you haven't already done so from wherever you get your favorite podcasts from. The ratings really help rank the podcast and get more people to find it. Also, if you know someone who is into wildlife filmmaking, or maybe they're a nature photographer and they're looking to transition and they aren't listening to the podcast currently, please tell them about it. Word of mouth is the best way for me to build my listeners uh, for this podcast. I would very much appreciate it. And also, if you are looking to break into the wildlife filmmaking industry and you're just looking for help, you're looking for answers, for burning questions that you have, then please consider looking at my Master Wildlife Filmmaking Mentoring uh, Group and Mentorship Program. You can find that at Jake Willers dot com and just click on the mentoring tab or learn more tab where it says it on just the home page there you can find it very very easily and then lastly if you want to help support this podcast the best way you can do it other than just telling other people about the podcast is to go to our patreon page it's patreon.com forward slash mwfp 
That's patreon.com m forward slash MWFP. And there you can get all sorts of bonus content. We have extracts from podcasts that didn't make it to the, these episodes because they went on so long uh, because I didn't want to stop talking with our guests. So we put the extra content there. There are catch up conversations with previous guests, finding out what they've been doing since I last spoke to them and so much more of the behind the scenes. Please consider taking a look. That is the best way to sponsor this podcast and get more episodes in the future.